Australia, a continent as old as time, where huge mountain ranges were thrown up and worn down long before the Himalayas were even formed. Surrounded by oceans on all sides, this island continent remained isolated from the rest of the world for millions of years. And in that time, a wondrous and unique variety of birds, mammals, and reptiles evolved. Yet in the last 200 years, an alien invasion. Species from another world has threatened their very existence. In 1788, the British colonised Australia. And into this fragile environment, they brought with them something totally foreign to this great southern land. Their animals. Horses, camels, pigs, goats, rabbits, foxes and cats all arrived with the Europeans. And when these animals escaped from the confines of the paddocks and homesteads, the results were devastating. This is the story of animals who have made Australia their home in the past 200 years. Their extraordinary ability to adapt and thrive. The havoc they've wreaked amongst the native species and the ongoing struggle as Australians try to control them and manage their presence. As Australia drifted north from Antarctica and South America around 45 million years ago, it severed its last land links with the rest of the world. The isolation of Australia has allowed for the evolution of unique species, each with a particular place within the ecosystem. Just how extraordinary this evolutionary journey has been is exemplified by the monotremes, mammals that lay eggs instead of giving birth to live young. Only two of these rare creatures are found on Earth, the echidna and the platypus, and only in Australia. Any disruption to the delicate balance of the environment was going to cause untold damage. As an island, Australia was extremely vulnerable to any invasion by alien species. And almost immediately, Australia's native animals began to disappear from the face of the earth. Rare and beautiful creatures gone forever. The natural competitors and predators that controlled these introduced species in their country of origin did not exist in Australia. There was nothing to stop them. And so from the arid interior to the wetlands of the tropical north, the herbivores adapted swiftly and ran wild in their new home, while the carnivores killed and ate everything in their path. In less than 200 years, 
These alien animals have changed the face of Australia, bringing more native species to extinction than anywhere else on Earth. Scientists and conservationists have been struggling to find a solution to the problem of feral animals in Australia, especially the feral cat. Beloved as a household pet by millions of Australians, the cat, when allowed to run wild, inflicts the most dreadful toll on the native mammals, birds and reptiles. The cat is a powerful hunter and an efficient predator. It has immense strength and some of the fastest reflexes of any animal. Its claws are sharp, its eyes are large and especially suited for hunting in low light. And it requires a steady diet of flesh to survive. Australia's beautiful mammals, such as the bilby and the sugar glider, are small and nocturnal, and ideal prey for an animal that hunts at night. Thanks to the feral cat, the bilby is now extinct, except for a few isolated pockets. The numbat faces a similar fate. Even more tragic is the plight of the marla and the stick nest rat, now only surviving in captivity. There are over 15 million feral cats in Australia. And without any natural predator, that number is increasing every year. A single cat can eat up to 20 native birds, lizards and mammals in a day. Multiply that by 15 million cats and the daily toll is staggering. Scientists have been studying the habits of the feral cat for years now in an effort to understand why and how this animal has become such a successful survivor in what is often an unforgiving environment. In a world first, these cats have been fitted with camera collars. Atticus Fleming from the Australian Wildlife Conservancy believes that only by studying how the cat operates can we hope to control it. Each feral cat on average was attempting to hunt 20 times a day roughly. It was successful on seven of those occasions. This footage shows the cat has captured and killed a native mouse. A cat's are live prey specialists, which is in fact one of the things that limits our ability to control them because they won't take bait readily. They're killing mammals, reptiles, birds, eggs, really having a terrible impact on Australia's wildlife. It's thought that the cat population in Australia arrived with the British in the first fleet. But the fact that cats quickly became so widespread throughout the remote outback deserts raised the question. Did they also come from ships that touched on the northern shores of Australia? Dutch explorers or Indonesian fishermen? Biologist Paul Wagner noted that British cats from the 18th century tended to a colouring of black and white. 
whereas Dutch cats of the same period were lighter in colour, and the Indonesian cat was ginger-coloured. Paul theorised that the lighter coloured cats must have come from somewhere else, probably Indonesia. He began tests on the DNA of feral cats to ascertain their origin. The result was surprising. Within Australia, there doesn't appear to be any major differences between Eastern and Western populations, which uh, suggests that they all had a single source of origin, which was British cats. What makes Paul's research so valuable is that having established that cats share the same origin, the focus now shifts as to how they've adapted so quickly, including the change in their fur colouring. Not only does the cat adapt swiftly and easily to the wild, its numbers are swelled by the thousands of unwanted cats who are dumped each year by their owners. Not everyone sees the feral cat as a pest. Here in a remote part of the central Australian desert, the Pintipi people live on their traditional land, a harshly beautiful landscape created by their mythical ancestors. The Pintipi have walked this land for thousands of years. They know every plant, rock and animal, and this seemingly barren place is, for them, a land of plenty, rich in food and history. These Pintipi women have always hunted the feral cat, as did their great-great-grandmothers before them. Their tracking skills are astonishing, and they can pick up the slightest signs of cat tracks in this huge landscape and follow them for hours. Ecologist Rachel Paltridge has been working with the Pintipi women for over 20 years, studying the habits of feral cats. The cat is very important to the Pintipi people. They love eating it. It's one of their, their favourite foods. So I asked them to rate the different bush meats that they eat last year, and the cat came out as number one. It's more favoured than kangaroo or bush turkey or goanna. They love eating cat. Pintipi people don't really see cats as a feral animal, they just see them as part of the landscape like everything else. The cat has been part of the Australian landscape now for over 200 years. Its skill at adapting and surviving make it a formidable enemy of the native wildlife, much like the fox. The fox has a lot in common with the cat. Like the cat, it hunts day and night. Its night vision is excellent. It is a cunning and effective hunter. The fox was originally brought to Australia for sport. Still determined to make Australia a replica of the land they had left, landowners took up the blood sport of fox hunting. A recreation Oscar Wilde once described as the unspeakable in pursuit of the uneatable. Soon there were foxes running wild throughout Australia. And with their cunning hunting instincts and ability to run at speeds up to 70 kilometres per hour, they were wreaking as much havoc amongst the native animals as the feral cat. The question is how to deal with this invasion and protect the local wildlife. The mindset has always been eradication, but now some are questioning if this is actually possible. Might there be ways to manage the invaders, even make use of them?
They may look harmless, but animals like the feral goat are a problem when it comes to the destruction of habitat. In some areas, the goats have contributed to the demise of the rock wallaby through competition, not just for food and water, but by taking over the rocky caves, the natural shelter of this native animal. From the original 19 that came with the first fleet, there are now more than three million goats running wild. Their hard hooves compact the earth, and this, coupled with their voracious appetites as they tear at the vegetation, degrades the soil and can turn grazing land into a dust bowl. Both conservationists and farmers are struggling to control their numbers. However, some farmers have been able to turn the problem of feral goats to their advantage. Angerickener Homestead is a 60,000 hectare farm where Alison lives with her family. Hi, boy. <laughs> Hi, boy. Her job, when she's not working in the wool shed or rounding up sheep, is looking for wild goats on the property. For Alison, goats are a source of income and they cost nothing. They don't have to buy them, breed them, feed them or fence them. All I have to do is find them. Uh, we're just going to take the plane out and have a look and see if we can find any goats. To drive around this vast property looking for goats would take days. An aerial search is the quickest way. Goat meat is the most consumed meat in the world, so there's a ready market for it. The income from goats has helped Alison and her family in the tough times through drought and falling wool prices. Income from goats has put my sister and I through our schooling education. We went away to boarding school in Adelaide. They're a good little income for us on the property here. They're also a declared pest, so we have a social responsibility to get rid of them off the property. Once she's spotted the goats, Alison heads back. She and her father set off on their bikes to begin the muster. Alison has created a thriving export business with the goats and at the same time is controlling a destructive pest. But while there are innovative solutions to be found for some introduced species, for others, the problem is far more complex and arouses passionate and heated debate. In the Alps of Southern Australia, another animal is running wild. The wild horse, or Brumby, as it's called here, with its strength and grace, has long been part of Australian folklore and has been romanticised in song and verse, along with the stockmen and the early pioneers. Oh, 
Originally brought to Australia as a means of transport and a beast of burden, by the 1800s, machines were already taking the place of the working horse. Unwanted horses were released into the wild, where they flourished. It's now estimated there are more than 300,000 wild horses in Australia. For some people, the wild horses have become a way of life. Glenn Simons runs a property in the high country of the Australian Alps. He and his wife, Julie, have a genuine affection for the Brumby. What? 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 That's just what they're used to coming to. You know, when, when they're not in sight, they come when they hear that noise. Yeah. What? I mean, how beautiful is it to see Brumbies at your doorstep? <laughs> you know, it doesn't get much better than that, does it? Really, I think it's the female thing. The horses seem to love the female attention. They really do. And uh, as far as that little mare's concerned, Julie just feeds her and brushes her and plays with her, and she thinks, oh, this is all right. You know, they might act like they're wild first up, but once they're really caught and broke in, they become very quiet. She's the type that we break in for kids, but, you know, that takes 18 months, two years to get them guaranteed quiet enough for kids. As much as they become friendly quick, you know, it's teaching them all the things that kids will do. Walk up behind them, want to give them carrots and bread and really sort of teach them just to be kid friendly. But the Brumby is also a menace in a land that had evolved to never feel the tread of a hoofed animal. The feral horse has been a disaster for the environment as it tramples the native vegetation and erodes the soil and fouls the water holes. The Brumbies compete with the native animals for food and water, especially in times of drought. They will travel long distances to find nourishment, leaving a trail of destruction in their wake. And as the weeks succumb to the harsh Australian environment, the strong become even stronger, creating a breed of horses that is perfectly suited to the country where it is running wild. Culling by an expert marksman is considered the most humane means of controlling the ever-increasing numbers of wild horses. But this has always been a deeply controversial and highly emotive topic. Herding horses into yards where they will be trucked away to a slaughter yard does little to reduce numbers and in many ways involves more suffering for the horse than culling. All right, you feel good? Yeah. While Glenn Simons successfully finds another home for one of his beloved Brumbies, it's merely a drop in the ocean. The problem of horses in the wild, their impact on the environment and how to control them continues to be a contentious and emotional issue in Australia.
Australia has one of the most diverse collections of plants and animals in the world. It also has the highest loss of mammal species. Feral cats and foxes kill an estimated 75 million native animals every night. The most endangered species of native animals can no longer survive in the wild, and the few that are left are being bred in captivity. Eventually, when the animals are able to fend for themselves, they're transported to an area which is fenced to keep out foxes and cats. Then at sunset, they're released and left to make their own way. The success of these breeding and release programs has led to an astonishing 65,000 hectares being set aside in the Tanami Desert of Central Australia, creating a safe haven sanctuary where these rare species can be reintroduced. We will be reintroducing at least 10 endangered mammals. Mammals that disappeared from Central Australia decades ago, in some cases a hundred years ago. One of the mammals that we will be reintroducing is a small species of kangaroo called the marla, or the rufous hair wallaby. And not only is it one of Australia's rarest kangaroos, it's also a species that has immense cultural significance for the traditional owners of New Haven. For the Walpuri people of the Tanami Desert, the Mala is an important ancestral being, part of the Walpuri dream. For tens of thousands of years, the Mala have watched over the Walpuri, guiding them through their lives. The disappearance of the Mala from their country is a great loss. The site where, for the traditional owners, the, the, the Mala originated is on the boundary of New Haven and, and some other Aboriginal land. So this is really restoring, not only saving one of our rarest animals, but restoring a very important part of the cultural um, landscape for traditional owners in Central Australia. It is a bit like turning back time. We now have a part of the Australian bush that really is very similar to what the bush would have been like when European explorers first arrived. You enter that bush as the sun sets, as night falls, the bush comes alive with small native animals. Now that's what Australia used to be like before feral cats arrived. There are bilbies everywhere, there are betongs everywhere, small wallabies. That is the Australian bush as it should be. It would seem that fencing off large tracts of land as sanctuaries is the only viable way of protecting Australia's native species in the short term. Meanwhile, culling, poisoning, sterilisation and biological warfare have all been tried at enormous expense and with mixed results. Meet the cane toad. Prior to 1935, Australia had a diverse population of frog species, but no toads. A native beetle was attacking the cane fields in northern Australia, causing huge crop damage. Rather than using insecticides to control the beetle, the cane toad was introduced into Australia in the hope it would naturally control the destructive insect. It was a mistake on several levels. Not least because beetles can fly and cane toads can't. The toads turned out to be a failure at controlling beetles, but remarkably successful at reproducing and spreading themselves. They now number well into the millions. The native quoll is the only carnivorous mammal, apart from the dingo on the Australian mainland. 
This predatory little animal is immensely strong for its size and kills its prey by jumping on its back and biting its neck. For the quoll, the cane toad was easy prey. What the quoll didn't know is that when the cane toad is threatened, it releases a toxin from the glands behind the eyes and across their back. In other words, they poison the animal who eats it. The native quoll, already under threat by foxes and cats, was in danger of becoming extinct. While science may have botched things with the introduction of the cane toad, it is trying something new to save the little quoll. Aversion therapy. A five-year study has found that captive quolls can be trained to avoid eating cane toads. Quolls reared in captivity are being fed a non-toxic sausage made from cane toad with a nausea-inducing chemical. When a quoll bites the sausage, it feels temporarily sick and deterred from cane toads once it comes into contact with them. As the rampaging toads spread inexorably throughout Australia, a community approach to their eradication is taking place. Known as toad busting, volunteers all over Australia are going out in hunting parties to capture the toad. But capturing a few toads is only the tip of the iceberg. Cane toads reproduce at an amazing rate. The female laying 30,000 eggs at a time. It seems the only way to have any long-term effect on the population is to stop them in the early stages of development. Scientists have found a way of trapping the toad tadpoles by using the toad's own poison as a bait. And this method is now destroying millions of potential toads. Mount Rothwell Conservation Park is Victoria's largest predator-free area. Some of Australia's most endangered species are being raised here. But rabbits threaten their very habitat. By 1920, Australia's introduced rabbit population had swelled to 10 billion. Once more, science was called in to solve the problem. And in an effort to halt the rabbit, Biological controls were introduced. By infecting the animals with a virus, plagues were initially reduced by 99%. But the indestructible rabbit soon developed an immunity to the disease and continued on its path of destruction. At Mount Rothwell, they even managed to get past the fences built to keep out other feral species. The fence is actually designed to keep out foxes, rabbits and cats. Um, while all cats and foxes were eliminated, uh, the rabbits have been a little bit more difficult to remove. And as a result, the whole, the whole landscape is covered in warrens and holes and um, there's not too much cover now. Annette Rapolsky is the manager of Mount Rothwell. She's using specially trained dogs to deal with the rabbit problem. So they've been trained to only target rabbits and to ignore species like quolls and bandicoots and betongs, possums and wallabies. The dogs have been super successful um, in controlling rabbits. They've eliminated uh, 8,000 in the last 12 months and their record is uh, 40 rabbits in less than four hours. Annette is also trialling the use of the native dogs, dingoes, as exclusive rabbit hunters. The dingoes were an experimental introduction, so we, we wanted to work out what role they play in our ecosystem. 
they do have heightened senses over the dogs. Um, they have larger ears, they're more streamlined, got longer legs, they move across the landscape more efficiently um, and it's, they do have a heightened sense of smell. So theoretically, if we can tune them into learning off the dogs, we might be able to um, work them to our benefit. The dingo is a comparative newcomer to Australia, arriving four to five thousand years ago, probably with Southeast Asian traders. Its lineage has been traced back to the Asian grey wolf. Once here, they became the apex predator. As Europeans spread out across the country, clear felling enormous tracts of land for sheep and cattle, the dingo was seen as a menace to be hunted and killed. The longest fence in the world was erected to keep the dingo out. Mainland Australia had suppressed its only apex predator. Dr Ewan Ritchie, an ecologist from Deakin University, has been studying what happens when you take the dingo out of the environment. He wants the dingo back. It's a concept known as rewilding. Rewilding is the idea of working with nature rather than against nature. We know that certain animals, like top predators, dingoes as an example, have these important roles in environments. So by using that to our advantage, we can actually try and solve some of these conservation issues. Behind Dr Ritchie's enthusiasm for reinstating the dingo is the successful introduction of wolves into the Yellowstone National Park in America. Overgrazing by deer was causing huge degradation to the environment. Their only natural predator, the wolf, was driven from the park over 70 years before. It was decided to bring the wolf back. As the deer population fell, the changes were soon apparent. The trees and plants flourished, and the native animals returned to the rivers and plains. Dr Ritchie hopes to see similar changes in Australia. When Europeans arrived, getting rid of dingoes didn't help us. We saw foxes and cats increase in their numbers when they were introduced by Europeans as well. We now have too many kangaroos in some parts of Australia. And so we know from our research that the dingo has a really important role there. It can help to keep down kangaroo numbers or feral pig numbers, feral cats, foxes. So it's a really important top predator in the system. And by bringing the dingo back and allowing it to recover to its natural population and its distribution, so where it's found, we could probably help recover the environment. So I've been studying dingo diets out in the desert for the last 20 years and I've got quite a lot of data now to show that the dingo is actually quite a significant predator of cats. About 15% of dingo scats contain cat and so that's the equivalent of a dingo eating probably one cat a week which is probably having quite an impact on their numbers out in the deserts. Dingoes coexisted with bilbies and marla for a long time, at least 5,000 years out in the desert without having an impact on them. They don't seem to send those animals to extinction like the cat does, and there's a lot of reasons for that. For one thing, dingo, dingoes live in packs, they sort of regulate their numbers, so you never get really high spikes 
in density like you can with cats after good seasons. Dingoes are also limited by water, whereas cats can just occur right through the desert. So one of the problems we have in conservation, of course, is that we're losing the battle. We're still seeing species go extinct. We're still seeing problems with invasive animals, overabundant herbivore populations, things like deer, uh, feral pigs, etc. So we need to start thinking a little bit outside the box and think what other solutions, what other tools do you maybe have to try and tackle some of these really pressing conservation issues. It's obvious that the question of controlling invasive species isn't just as simple as limiting numbers. Scientists and conservationists are now looking at other, more innovative ways to solve the problem. Middle Island Penguin Sanctuary in South Australia, where foxes reduced a colony of 1,000 penguins to just 40 in four years. All attempts to stop the foxes failed. It looked like the end for the penguins. Marimars are a breed of guardian dogs that have been used in Europe for centuries to successfully guard livestock. A local poultry farmer was using the dogs to keep the foxes away from his chickens and thought it might be a good idea if the dogs were used to guard the penguins. Since the introduction of these dogs, there have been no reported fox kills of penguins on the island. And numbers are again on the increase. Conservationists are now looking to trial this method of protection with other endangered species. The eastern barred bandicoot was on the brink of extinction until Zoos Victoria intervened. We could have very easily lost the Eastern Barred Bandicoot. They wouldn't be here, you know, foxes and cats would have eaten the lot. So we have an opportunity here to bring an animal back from the very brink of extinction. Dave Williams at Werribee Zoo in Victoria is training Marima dogs to protect the tiny bandicoot. Marima dogs have a natural protective instinct, a non-aggressive, and are not natural hunters. The part of conditioning guardian dogs to the animals that they're going to be looking after starts very, very young in the imprinting phase of their development. So, you know, we're talking sort of eight weeks old, up to about 20 weeks old, and, you know, it'll start with just scents, scents and smells and sounds, and we get the bandicoot nesting material and introduce that to the puppies very early on. So, you know, before they, long before they meet a bandicoot, they know what they smell like and there's something that sort of naturally occurs in, in the environment we have them in. The dogs scent mark, they patrol, and they bark day and night. The other animals realise that there's dogs in there and it changes their behaviour. So long before there's any confrontation, the behaviour changes and the animals are, are protected. The dogs will take two years to train. After that, they'll be moved out into a 50 hectare trial site with the bandicoots. The hope is the dogs will provide protection for the population of eastern barred bandicoots without the need for a predator-proof fence. We have a really big problem in Australia with conservation. We've lost 30 mammal species since European arrival, which is the worst record anywhere in the world. I think for conservation, we need to look at all possibilities and all tools that we have. So we absolutely need our sanctuaries because some of our small mammal populations, our species, have so few numbers now that if we just took down the fences and they would disappear and become extinct very quickly. So we need those sanctuaries to protect those critically endangered animals. But at the same time, we do need to be thinking about long-term solutions. There are massive parts of Australia where the native animals have gone and the landscape is largely silent and empty. And that is 
in large part because of feral cats, as well as foxes and other invasive animals like rabbits. You know, our mission, in a sense, is to restore as much of Australia as we can, to bring back those animals so that Australia is again full of those extraordinary native mammals that are found nowhere else on the planet. Science tells us that wherever there is an effect, there is a cause. All animal populations, once they are introduced into an ecosystem, become part of its biodiversity. The critical question is how to manage those populations in a humane and ecologically viable way. Only by studying the multiple interactions between native animals and the newcomers and seeing how both adapt to the environment can we hope to find a balance that will allow Australia's native species to thrive?